Guernica is a coastal village at 30 kilometers east of Bilbao, in the province of Vizcaya. Together with Lumo, they form a municipality. The 2008 census registered 16,255 inhabitants. For centuries, it was a meeting place where even the monarchs of Castile would gather to swear the so-called fueros, or laws of Biscay. The title of King of Castile and Navarra included the title of Señor de Vizcaya. This ceremony took place around an ancient oak tree, known as Guernica Corvola. At present, this oak symbolizes freedom for the Basque people. In 1826, the old church of La Antigua, also a meeting place, was demolished and replaced with a more suitable construction known as Casa de Juntas, a neoclassical building that took six years to build. The Basque language is one of the most ancient languages in the world. Its origins are unknown. In Western Europe, the Basques are the only indigenous people that have kept an ancient non-Indo-European language, the only one that has survived. The Spanish Civil War broke out on the 18th of July, 1936, when a section of the National Army under the leadership of four generals rebelled against the democratic government of the Spanish Republic. Meanwhile, Europe was suffering a great economical depression and was divided by fascism. The Second World War was very near. Given Guernica's historical power, the town became an important target for Franco. Monday, 26 of April 1937, market day, the town was bombed by the German Condolision. General Franco, however, denied any association with the massacre. According to historian Professor Preston, the first and ridiculous excuse given was that the bombing was carried out by the Basques in an attempt to fabricate an atrocity. The second argument claimed that it had been an error, as the only target was the breach, for the purpose of blocking any withdrawal. Preston explains that if that had been true, there was no need to use incendiary bombs. Those bombs, in seconds, set the town's wooden houses in fire. According to the historian, the bombing was without doubt a clean-up operation carried out by the Condolision, but authorized by the supreme command of the Spanish rebel forces. Franco might not have known the exact details of the operation, but he had given the Germans the go-ahead to execute the massacre. It is believed that the attack was an attempt to demoralize the Basque people. Guernica was not the first bombing of civilians carried out by Franco's allies. A month earlier, Durango, another Basque town, had already been massacred by the Italian forces, also allies of the rebels. There were 294 casualties. Because of the market, the streets of Guernica were packed full of people, not only locals, but also people from neighboring villages. Franco offered Hitler the possibility to try a new type of aerial artillery. They called it Operation Rubin. The two first German squadrons set off at about 4.30 in the afternoon, and the third squadron left Burgos a few minutes later. This squadron dropped a cargo of 250 and 50 kilo bombs, as well as one kilo incendiaries. The latter form a third of the cargo. The attack ran from north to south, coming from the Bay of Biscay and up the course of the rivers Mundaka and Oka. A total of 29 planes were used in this massacre. After the bombing, the Henkels 51 strafed civilians on the roads out of town, where people were desperately fleeing, trying to save their lives. By 7.45 p.m., after the last aircraft left, Guernica no longer existed. 70% of the buildings were left in flames. The bombs destroyed the large majority of the houses, and those that escaped the bombs were burned down by the fire. The heat produced by the incendiary bombs 
could reach up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire finished up the massacre. In 1937, Guernica had 7,000 inhabitants. 70 years later, historians have not yet reached a complete agreement on the exact number of victims. There is a version that claims 1,654 dead and 889 wounded. A most recent one gives a figure between 120 and 300. 22 tons of bombs were dropped on this small town. Oddly enough, the Casa de Juntas and the famous Guernicaco Arbola, the symbolic oak tree, both survived the inferno. After the war, Franco abolished all the autonomies and established a military regime that lasted 39 years. The town of Guernica, however, never lost its symbolic value. Almost half a century later, on the 29th of December 1978, when democracy had been re-established, the existing Statue of Autonomy of the Basque Country was approved in this mythological town. From then on, all the Legenda Caris, Basque presidents, they come to swear their oath in Guernica. Weeks before the bombing, the government of the Republic had commissioned a painting to Pablo Picasso. The picture would represent Spain at the Paris International World Exhibition of 1937. It is ironic that the Spanish pavilion was placed between the pavilion of Soviet Russia and that of fascist Germany. An accurate portrait of international affairs, as fascism was fighting against communism to overpower the Iberian Peninsula. At the time, Picasso was living in the French capital and was not at all clear about the subject matter for his painting. The pictures of the Guernica massacre, instructed by Franco, were everywhere on the papers. Picasso started his large oil on the theme of the Basque slaughter. The painting was completed in two months in his studio at Rue des Grands Augustins, and he titled it Guernica. On those days, Picasso's companion was Dora Mar, a cultured woman born in France, daughter of a Jewish architect of Yugoslavian origin. Dora was a photographer as well as a painter and sculptor. She was part of the surrealist Parisian movement and her work was often exhibited next to the renowned photographer Man Ray. Dora and Picasso had met six months before the outbreak of the civil war. Perhaps Picasso saw in this woman the stereotype of the tragic figure, someone that reflected the sorrows of the time. Dora could not have children, something that has led me to think that the character of the mother with the dead child in the picture might have been inspired by the frustrated motherhood of the painter's companion. Amongst all Picasso's companions, she was probably the most ambiguous. Furthermore, Dora grew up in Argentina, and unlike his other lovers, Spanish was her first language. Seven photographs of the process of the painting taken by her have survived, and thanks to this work, we now have a superb register of the painting's development. Prior and during the making of Guernica, Picasso had done countless works on the theme of the horse, the bird and the bull. They were all very well settled in his pictorial vocabulary. Many compasses and drawings were also done inspired in Dora's tears. Hence why, for several reasons, this woman was very important in the progress of this painting. The final result was a monochromatic compass 3.5 meters high and 7.82 meters long, painted in oils. The brown tapestry we have temporarily here at the Whitechapel Gallery is an interpretation of the original, owned by Mrs. Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller handed over the painting permanently on loan to the United Nations in New York. The painting hangs in the corridor in the entrance of the United Nations Security Council. It was there during the catastrophes of Rwanda, Bosnia and Iraq. The tapestry was woven in Paris in 1955, in the studio of Jacqueline de la Boum du Rouvague. We know that the process was supervised by Picasso. 
There are two more tapestries manufactured in the same studio. One in silver and grey, the colour of money, woven the year after Picasso's death. It is the property of the Musée Anterlinden of Colmar in Alsace, in France, where it is exhibited. The image in the screen is courtesy of the Musée. The other in red, the colour of blood, was made nine years later for the Museum of Modern Art in Gunma, in Japan. The image is also courtesy of the Japanese Museum. We know therefore that Picasso supervised the one that we have here, the Whitechapel, but not the other two. Let's remember that this tapestry is not an exact copy, it is only an approximate copy of the original. Later we can perhaps discuss how we interpret the colour changes in these tapestries. After the seven versions photographed by Dora Mar and hundreds of drawings and sketches, Picasso decided to limit the canvas to black and white and many tonalities of grey. The greys often reflect softly pink and blue. Guernica represents death, destruction and human sorrow in black and white. Let's now look at the final image. The composition consists of three triangles. A central pyramid and a triangle at either side. The scene could be taking place in a basement or wall shelter. We could divide the interior in four parts. The first part on the left with the bull, the woman with the dead child and one exit. The second with the gutted horse, the wounded bird on the table, the electric lamp and the dead and dismembered soldier. The third with the ghost-like image entering from the top window and holding an oil lamp or lantern, the second woman with a wild look crouching down and two more exits, and the fourth and last where a man trapped under some wooden planks is being burned alive. There is also a small window and a door ajar. We do not know, however, if the door leads to another room or if there is an exit to the outside. The fact that the painting is done in black, white and a huge range of greys helps to create a symbolic darkness. In one same space there are several spaces. Picasso is using the pictorial space that he learned through cubism and manipulates it at leisure. Let's now see the first stage of the painting photographed on the 11th of May 1937. We do not see any basement yet. It seems as if the scene is taken place in the open air. There is a small construction from which the female ghost holding a lantern emerges. The characters are all there except for the bird. On the floor there are several bodies that will soon be erased. The soldier has his arms wide open and it is drawn in the position of a naked Christ. Picasso places him underneath the dying horse. The painting has already six clear movements. It is important to mention that the lantern is placed exactly in the center of the composition and will not move. Let's now see the second stage. The body of the Christ soldier is no longer clear. Picasso covers it, perhaps to be able to work better the rest of the composition. The right arm of the soldier is now holding a bunch of flowers or wheat, it's not clear. A giant sun screens the hand of the soldier. The lantern continues there untouched, but the dead bodies on the floor are slowly removed. We do not know yet if it is going to be an interior or an exterior or both. In the third version we see the moon. The soldier has been dismembered and his face has turned over facing down. What was earlier a sun is now an oval shape in flames. The mouth of the horse has already a dagger or plectrum, but the bull and the woman do not yet have one. The breasts of the feminine profile, or ghost holding the lantern, also have plectrums. This feminine image most probably comes from this Indian ink and wash on paper done by Picasso the year before on the 10th of May. He titled it Wounded Minotaur, Horse and Personage. 
In the Guash, a dying Minotaur has been fatally wounded by a large spear, while a horse with wings that could also be flames is on top of him. Leaning over a softly sketched wall, a feminine character contemplates the scene. This woman could be the woman of the lantern. Let's remember that in the Guernica, the horse is also placed on top of the rider. It is important to mention that the body of the bull occupies the main center-left section of the compass. In the fourth version, Picasso has already decided that the scene will take place in a basement. The head of the soldier is still facing down. The woman with the dead child remains the same and will continue unaltered. But the body of the bull has turned completely towards the left. Thanks to this move, the horse is now able to lift up its head dramatically. By now, the body of the bird is also clearly drawn. The man in the right, being burned alive, has extended his arms. Now, they have the same position than those of the soldier in the first stage. In the fifth version, the arms of the burning man are high up in the air. Picasso has also added some flames on top of the small window above the man. In this way, that section of the composition is better lit. The breasts of the female ghost are now two semicircles with a weird pole. The left section of the painting is still dark, except for the tail of the bull. The central compositional triangle has been accentuated. In the sixth stage, Picasso lightens the picture further by placing a rectangle on the body of the burning man. This rectangle will later become his executive trousers. The painter is not yet sure about dressing the two women, and therefore he covers them with two decorated rectangles, the same way that he had covered the soldier in the second version. In the seventh version, the body of the horse is decorated with a design that resembles newspaper writing. He could be making an allusion to the papers where he read the news of the bombing. The head of the soldier is now facing up and the body is completely dismembered. It is interesting that the soldier has been from the very beginning his great dilemma. Maybe because soldiers are both defenders and aggressors. It all depends in which side of the trench they fight. The body of the bull is now in front of a new exit. Therefore, by now, the three exits are clear. The one on the right, where there are flames everywhere and the door is ajar. The way out in the center, via the two windows, one on top of the other. And the one on the left, where the bull is standing. The tail of the bull, high up in the air, could also be read as a flame. Fire is everywhere. Even the lampshade, with the bulb hanging from the ceiling, is in flames. Let's now look at the characters one by one. We will begin with the one on the right of the painting. Who is this man? Why is he wearing a beard and a striped t-shirt in the early sketch? Is he a sailor? Or is he the author of the picture wearing his favorite t-shirt? The man has lost his shoes in his race to the shelter. Picasso dresses him with striped trousers, symbolizing perhaps a businessman. The hair under his armpits gives him a more dramatic appearance. He's trapped under some burning wooden planks and his entrails are out. Let's see now the image of a paw and semicircles, or breasts with daggers. Let's remember that these intriguing images were originally the breasts of the female ghost with the lantern. The same dagger will appear inside the mouth of the horse, the mouth of the woman, and that of the bull. What is Picasso trying to tell us with this imagery? In 1932, Carl Jung wrote a controversial article about the psychology of Picasso. Together with James Joyce, he diagnosed them not as psychotics, but as persons whose habitus it is to react to a profound psychic disturbance. Young explains that this reaction does not correspond with an ordinary psychoneurosis, but with a schizoid syndrome or personality disorder. 
With this, he is not saying that those artists are schizophrenic, but that in the interior voyage to the unknown, many creators are forced to enter difficult and dangerous roads that often cross roads with dimension. As Salvador Dali once said, the only difference between a madman and me is that I'm not mad. The meanings given to the characters of Guernica are many and varied, and in my opinion, they are all subjectively accurate. Let's now look at the delicate way in which he has drawn the bird. He was probably hit by one of the explosions and landed on the table that we see behind the horse. It is a cheek, it has a broken wing, and it is shouting. Picasso is not painting a dove or a pigeon, but a small hatchling. Worse still, the bombardment does not eradicate the symbol of peace. It exterminates any possible offspring. Often, the bulb is interpreted as the omnipotent god, the absent god. Three types of light crown the two symbolic animals. The electric light of the bulb, the light of the lantern, and the light of the metal shade in flames. Fire and light, with all its implications, meet here in a way that does not make any sense, as if it was schizophrenia. Picasso was sure from the very beginning about the position of the character of the female ghost with the oil lamp. God might be absent, but the painter is bringing a feminine presence to light the interior. The ghostly presence is feminine and has a gentle expression on her face. But let's not forget that this character has plectrums in her breasts and perhaps a feline paw replaces her hand. The second woman is also looking towards the left. Like the horse, her left leg is kneeling down. Her breasts seem to have baby dummies instead of nipples and her naked thighs are covered in scratches. Picasso has painted daggers in the breasts of one of the women and baby dummies in the breasts of the other. What is he trying to tell us with this? The second woman is young. Her skirt is tucked up and she is wearing a hand knitted shawl on her shoulders. She is not wearing shoes either. They all have lost them in their race to the shelter. Look at the expression on her face. Has she gone mad? The small burned particles seem to be falling down from her right hand, and the position of her arms brings to mind the famous photo of the Vietnamese little girl, the child burned by napalm in the bombing of 1972 carried out by the government of the United States. Perhaps a premonition. Behind the woman there is a window. Picasso uses windows, apertures, light or dark, where and how he wishes. In the center of the painting we see the horse, symbolic in many cultures of virility, sensuality and beauty. Once again, the meanings are numerous and subjective at the same time. The horse, always loyal, either plowing the land or in the battlefield. His tongue is a dagger and with little imagination we could hear his winning. The lower part of his teeth is slightly tilted, as if it was going to burst out of his mouth. The eyes of the horse have the same expression as those of the kneeling woman. Animals and humans in one same experience. A large spear has gone through his stomach. Picasso had seen horses with their entrails out on many occasions. His regular visits to the bullfighting ring provided him with many references. The impact of the explosions seems to be blowing the mane of the horse, while his rider lies dead and dismembered under his hoofs. The 26th of April was a spring day. That afternoon, Hitler's aerial artillery bombed the town hour after hour, turning it to shreds. The soldier has his arms mutilated, but his hand still holds his broken sword. From it, a flower comes out. Man destroys, but nature continues unstoppable in its cycles, and Picasso knows it and reminds us of it. There is an ancient ballad known as the Song of Roland. It was inspired in a battle that took place in the Basque country in the 8th century. The ballad tells us how Roland, the captain that fought against the Basque, 
Before dying, he smashed his sword against a rock to make sure that it would not fall onto the enemy's hands. Perhaps because he was thinking the same thing when he smashed the soldier's weapon. The dismembered head of the dead soldier has his eyes and mouth open, an image that reminds us of the photograph of Che Guevara taken after his execution in La Higuera in Bolivia in October of 1967. Another premonition, perhaps. The Greeks attribute the bull to the god Zeus, symbolic of both passion and power. In every culture, this animal has its particular significance. In Spain, the bull refers at its worst to machismo, and at its best to virility and courage through the traditional corrida where a man fights beast. The bull appears constantly in Picasso's work, not only in Guernica. Its meaning is complex and has many interpretations. Curiously, in the mountains of the Basque country, there are many caves with a great variety of Paleolithic paintings. The bull and the horse are very often represented. Therefore, we can see that from the very beginning of history, both images have had meaning and power. Some historians claim that the bull here represents Franco. Others attribute it to fascism or to the brutality of war. The interpretations are many and all valid. If we bear in mind that the painter rarely pronounced himself in the meaning of his images. Picasso places the beast to the end of the picture on the left. Behind the animal, there is the only aperture open to the exterior, and the bull blocks it. An outstanding representation of irrational power. The same brutal force that waged the country during the 39 years of tyranny that followed the civil war. The tail of the bull is up in the air, showing his meaty anus, as if he was going to defecate. His genitals are placed at the same height as the naked breasts of the woman with the dead child. The body of the beast works as a screen for the body of the woman. The mouth of the bull and the mouth of the woman are parallel to each other, an interesting juxtaposition. The right hand of both the baby and the mother have the same contraction as if the woman could feel in her own flesh the numbness of her dead infant. The head of the baby is hanging down by its own weight, while the head of the woman is stretching up by the hysteria of her pain. Reminiscent of Goya's Saturn, where a father is devouring his son. The same pictorial device is used here by Picasso. As the arrows show, there is a very strong tension as a result. Horse and bull, enemies in the arena, are placed here together in one same interior. If we were to go against the current, we could leave the enemy outside with the German Nazi bombers and add the character of the bull to the remaining characters in the shelter. In this way, the group could represent the dying Spain under the sword of Franco. Practically nothing is superimposed, and therefore the painting has a strong feel of two dimensions. From every single viewpoint, the painting hits you in the face. Although the basement has three windows and a door ajar, all the characters are looking towards the left, and no one dares to get out. Whatever they do, they will die all the same. When Guernica was exhibited at the International Exhibition in Paris in 1937, the German critics described it as a minestrone of human bits that a child of four could have painted, a madman's dream. The Soviets, although they supported the government of the Republic, they did not approve of it either, giving the painting a cold response. But the public in general and the art world welcomed Guernica euphorically. At the end of September 1938, the painting travelled to England and was exhibited in the cities of London, Leeds, Liverpool and Manchester. New Burlington Galleries exhibited the painting in the glamorous West End of London. In January 1939, the Whitechapel Gallery exhibited Guernica with much success in the decrepit east of the city. The exhibition raised the awareness of the British people. 
painting portrayed better than words the fascist invasion that Spain was suffering. The Whitechapel Gallery collected money from those that could give it or good second-hand boots that were sent to the front line. They also recruited volunteers for the international brigades. Finally, the painting was sent to New York under instructions of Picasso to the Museum of Modern Art and remained there in deposit for many years. The painter specified that Guernica would not return to Spain until the country had recovered its democracy and republic. He also said that the painting should be housed at the Prado Museum. Picasso died in exile in 1973, two years before the death of the dictator. Sadly, he was never able to return home. In 1981, eight years after his death and in the centenary of his birth, Guernica returned to Spain, to Madrid. Our country had at long last the awaited democracy and MoMA returned the painting to the Spaniards. It was exhibited at the Casón del Buen Retiro next to the Prado Museum. It remained there under bulletproof glass until 1992. Later, it was transferred to the Reina Sofia Museum, and it is still there. The controversy continues, as many Basques believe that the painting should be housed either in the town of Guernica or in the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Other Spaniards think that it should be at the Prado Museum, as Picasso instructed. And I will conclude with a quote dating from 1935 and registered in a conversation between the Greek collector and writer Christian Zervo and Pablo Picasso. He said, A painting is not thought out and settled in advance. While it is being done, it changes as one's thoughts change. And when it is finished, it goes on changing, according to the state of mind of whoever is looking at it. And to prove this statement, I will mention the incident occurred on the 5th of February 2003 in New York. It was exactly 43 days before the bloody invasion of Iraq, carried out by the United States Army. The Secretary of State Colin Powell appeared in the United Nations in front of this tapestry. His intention was to convince the world about Iraq's violation of their agreement and the need to declare war to them. To this date, there is no explanation of why, but the Americans decided to cover the tapestry with a blue cloth. Probably, Guernica was acting as a screen, alerting the viewer of the new massacres and the thousands of casualties that would very soon take place. 67 years later, the images of Picasso were still alive, and for as long as they stand up, they will continue to remind us, as well as warning us, of the extensive parameters of human cruelty. Thank you.